<laughs> telling people about what happened and asking them to really give to the church, give to the poor, and to, to the priest. And to at least if they're going to take the candles, to put something there at the Bangadi, at the candle stand. Well, the devil really, oh my God, people reprimanded me, oh, this uh, priest is cares about money, oh, oh the guy yeah. who cares is money. Uh, the Georgians were very upset. They said, he called us cheap. I said, <laughs> I never called you cheap because you didn't give anything. <laughs> I mean to come to that wow to that extreme. Yes. And I remember some of because the Because the church has to buy the candles. Yeah. Who is paying for those? Forget uh, it. I mean this uh, Church of Cyprus traditionally yeah. is being a church of giving. Yes. Especially missions in Africa. This little island. Yeah. Okay. There were there was a we call it the uh, golden uh, monastery of Kikos of uh, the Virgin Mary that was so Breach uh, that you know could buy wow. <laughs> uh, you know b b places yes. in uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever. It was bankrupt because they gave dowries to uh, oh, to girls. girls I, yeah. I'm not saying that it was, it was bad, but you know you give so much, you give everything, you go bankrupt. How are you going to give? How yeah. are you going to offer yeah. any money or help to other people or to? to missions and what have you. So I was very upset. And I remember the Greek proverb, uh, pan metron ariston, everything in moderation. You see, I believe that the Greek civilization really helped Christianity, and Christianity helped uh, the Greeks too. But I'm saying that all these uh, proverbs, all these, the philosophy, even the... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know the the way of thinking. You, you call it phronema, the the orthodox one, but it has a lot of there's a the or, Greek. Or politia. There's a whole way of life, a uh, way of life. Yeah, even even the Greek together. mythology. Yes, even a lot of other things. Philosophy mm -hmm. that has given to Christianity a lot of things, and to, certain especially to wisdom. keep some kind of balance. Yes, I mean extreme situations. Even when so you on say the one hand, faith, I mean, to have an extreme faith, it's good. No, it's called fanaticism. How many murders and how many uh, wars started because of, of uh, religious fanaticism? We have to keep some kind of balance. Okay, and so, this is what so this, the Greek this is, civilization did. So this did. reminded you, so let me get back to what, because this all started because we were talking about Ananias and Sapphira, and you were... it sort of reminded you about the sort of the opposite was 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 happening or is happening currently at least on the island of cyprus where they're not passing any trays and people aren't even putting money for candles and of course they don't have pledges they don't become members of the church the way we do here so they're giving nothing at all because there are some parishes here in america like when you were serving at saint andrews up in uh, san luis obispo they also were not passing a tray. Of course, they had something there for candles, but they weren't passing a tray. And there's some other parishes where they've kind different. of abol they they've abolished had it. Pledges they had pledges. So people would cover were giving all the expenses and yeah. what have you. That so was that's different. different. So, so, but even the, the not passing the tray, because we kind of, and I understand that, but even that, like you mentioned, when you were growing up, they passed a tray, you said, for the priest, uh, for him, but also for the poor people. That's kind of an important, that was the way, in other words, what you're getting at is that people were taught to give. That was important. And that's what you th saw missing. And this is why you spoke so about it. It wasn't uh, for the priest because now the priests are paid by the government in, in and Cyprus, the church yes. for both. And uh, when I asked, why is this? Oh, they said the church is rich. The church is rich for how long? I mean, they have to be build all these beautiful yeah, Byzantine they, churches, millions of pounds and dollars. So people and, don't and raise years. money for that. Who pays for the construction of those churches? That's the government? The metropolises. The metropolises. And I'm sure the government is yeah. giving because something. Because that church was a very large and church. I'm sure the people, some serving. people also yeah. donate money. Uh, now the the Russians, some, uh, I guess some of the oligarchs, build this beautiful church. I was reminded by a Cypriot called Andreas the other day about something that they build is so beautiful and so 
uh, rich and what have you. And I, it's not that I go for these great uh, cathedrals and what have you. But the thing is, people should give. And I think, or not I think, I believe that in, on this earth, we are uh, stewards. That's right. We are managing the property of God. That's right. And we should not just, uh, you know, accept this and say, oh, others build a church and this, we don't have to do anything. Yeah. No, we have to become good stewards. And if in the Old Testament we have the, the 10%, you know, Jesus goes one step farther. He he, he praises the, the widow who gives one or two drachmen. You know, why? Because she does it. It's a sacrificial giving. Right. She is deprived and depriving her children of basic things to eat in order to give to God, to the temple or to the poor or whatever. So we have to give. And especially at this time, just before Christmas, and I will explain to you a few things later on, why some people are asking, why does Father Costa like Christmas so much? I will explain <laughs> that to you. Okay. And this is part so, of it. But anyway, we need to be thankful, grateful to God. The opposite is ingratitude, acharistia. It's, it's a very serious uh, uh, sin to be uh, ungrateful. So, now, uh, Jeannie and I, uh, actually it was my wife, I have to give her the credit. You know, when we see people, when we drive and, you know, they, they're asking for money and what have you, throw them a dollar or whatever. So uh, she decided to do something more organized. So she got envelopes and she put in there $5, $10, uh, $20 bill and what have you. I suggested being maybe a cheap guy. I said, what about putting some empty envelopes? Because <laughs> no, some of these people didn't. are not real. <laughs> you didn't. So he, she he said, was she, she told me, she says, you know, someone who gets an envelope and it's empty, he may curse God. So we said, no empty envelopes. <laughs> it was, it was, you would never have <laughs> so, done that. And, and I suggested, uh, you know, some of you who agree or whatever would like to do the, the same thing. Instead of giving a dollar and throwing it like, you know, you show off in the middle of the uh, cross. At, at any rate, to get back to the original point, because you started this, you had a very strong reaction to that Ananias and Sapphira story and our discussion of it last week. And your point was that you did not understand this so much, but what your point was and what Chrysostom said, because we read from Chrysostom last week, that this was a sacred promise. They had pledged this money to the church. And this is actually what St. Peter said also in the story. And this is in Acts chapter 5, in case you don't know what story we're talking about. But they had said that they were going to give all of the proceeds of the land that they had sold to the church. And St. Peter said, well, you had the right not to give any of it or to give only part of it. But since they had decided, and I said, I guess, pledged to give all of it, then they withheld some of it. And because that was a sacred promise that they had made, this is why they were punished in such a dramatic fashion. Yes. Is that why? Okay. I, I just want to emphasize that we have to, um, to give more sacrificially. Yes. We have to be happy givers, okay? Uh Cheerful give it with our is. cheerful, give yes. it with our hearts and what have you. And um, not uh, complaining later on, oh, I gave this and I, I lost this, I could have kept it and all this. Well, you know, when it comes to giving, we all know that we are guilty. For all these years, we haven't given our tithes, we haven't given what we are supposed to give. So nobody can say, I gave enough. I gave you enough mm. because nobody has given enough. Because God now, gives us very freely and we can always yeah. do more and we should do more. I want to remind you that the tithing, giving 10%, comes from Leviticus 27, chapter 27, verses 28, 32, and other places of the, of the Bible. But as I said, Jesus is asking us to give Even more. more. And of course, that's what we see with the saints, isn't it, Father? You know, when we see... When we read the stories of the saints, and we hear about somebody like St. Paisios, they kept everything, and they would give away everything. We had, um, our brother-in-law had sent St. Paisios a uh, cassock, remember that? 
You, you know the story, right? So uh, our, our brother-in-law, who's now uh, has fallen asleep in the Lord, he knew St. Paisios personally, and he had, he, and of course, a lot of these, especially the more saintly monks there. I think it was St. Joseph. I was, oh, was it Joseph? Elder, no, I think it was Elder, Elder Joseph the Hesychus. <laughs> At any rate, he had sent him a, um, a cassock, and he, because his was pretty threadbare, and he never opened, even opened the package, but he had torn open a little hole in the package. He saw what it was because uh, Nicholas had said, I'm going to send you this. And so he received it, but he kept it for somebody else who came who didn't have one, who didn't have anything. So um, we can always do more. We can always give more. And I think that your point here, Father, is that that this is a spiritual, um, it's very important for our spiritual life to be generous and to to give to others, to give to the church. It's extremely important. And if not, it's it's really quite impossible to have a heart that's open to God and um, that that's going to be open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And... Absolutely. Okay. But we know that the apostolic church, the first, the, the original church, uh, considered remembering the poor to be among the Highest, the most, most important. basic moral imperatives. Galatians two, uh, verse ten. But you know, Christians continue to take care of the human needs of, of people, um, the succeeding centuries, and the, a proof of that, the living proof, was the, the monasteries and the convents. You know, poor people were going there that's to true. to eat. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, they you know, still they still take free. care of the poor. Yeah, they, they never still do. charge people for no. for Even eating now. or staying there. That's right. For the night or for the nights or whatever, um, and we um, in the Middle Ages, the people think it was the Dark Ages of Christianity. Are you kidding me? The the monasteries, the monks, the nuns, they did so much. Mm -hmm. I mean. Read the the book of uh, Father Costandellus about the philanthropy of the Byzantine Church, and and other books. I mean, what the the Catholics did or the the Protestants, incredible things. Okay, well, we're going to have to take a break here for a minute, and then uh, join us after the break, and then we're going to talk about some other subjects. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about Father Costa's background, and we'll talk about Father Costa and the Bible. Okay, so join us after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantinou, host of the live call-in show, Search the Scriptures Live on Ancient Faith Radio. How many times have you found yourself contemplating one of my assertions or explanations about the Bible? Do you ever come away from the program feeling as though you had learned something new, attained an insight that will have serious ramifications for your approach to the Orthodox Christian life? For over 14 years now, since 2008, I have been doing a deep dive into Holy Scriptures with the Church Fathers as our guides, and in that time I have heard from countless listeners whose perspectives on the Bible have drastically changed after hearing something on my program, Search the Scriptures, and then later Search the Scriptures Live. It brings me so much joy and satisfaction to know that a weekly live show such as this one can actually affect minds and lives. Glory to God! That having been said, did you know that Search the Scriptures Live is not the result of my efforts alone? Quite the contrary. In addition to the editors, producers, and engineers who work on the program, it takes you, the listener, to make Search the Scriptures possible. That's right. Without your generous contributions to Ancient Faith Radio, there would be no discussions of the resurrection or the end times or the books of the Bible. There wouldn't even be an Ancient Faith Radio. Would you please take a moment right now to add your contribution to those of other faithful AFR fans who help keep shows like Search the Scriptures Live on the Air? 
It's an easy process. Just go to ancientfaith.com and click on the Donate button in the upper right-hand corner. Be a participant. Be a partner. Become an Ancient Faith Radio donor today. Thanks in advance for your generosity. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. All righty. So yes, we are back. And I'm here with Father Costa Costandinu, my husband, who is um, uh, joining us for this entire program because it's very hard to get him to join us ever for an entire program. But since I did, I wanted to explore with him some of his background about the Bible and his education and things like this. So we start, we launched right into the program without talking too much about him because he wanted to talk about Ananias and Sapphira. So um, I just want to give you a little bit of information about him. He mentioned, as he mentioned, he was born on the island of Cyprus. That's spelled C- C Y P R U S, not Cyprus like the tree, which is, oh, there's a Cyprus, California, C Y P R E S S, but Cyprus, the country. It's a small country, it only has about a half a million people who live there. It's on an island One in the million. eastern. Now it's one million? Okay, so I stand corrected. An island in the eastern Mediterranean, beautiful country that's had a very rich history and been a, a prize uh, and was taken over by lots of different invaders. And the people are, it's a, quite an interesting place to live and to visit. So it's a beautiful island. As, as Father Costa said, um, St. Paul went there. So there was a church of Cyprus before there was a church of Greece. So it's one of the oldest Christian churches. And the Church of Cyprus, the uh, Jews from Cyprus had come to Antioch. And so they were the ones who really started the mission to the Gentiles. But uh, before we get over to that, let's talk a little bit more about Father Costa. He, uh, he was born in Cyprus when it was still a British colony. So recently we, had, so we all saw the funeral of the Queen. Well, that was Queen Elizabeth II. And Father Costa was born when it was uh, a colony of the British. And... Um, lived through the era where they fought for their independence from Great Britain. His father was a policeman, and he was in charge of different parts of the island, so they moved around quite a bit from village to village, and he served in different regions of the island. And uh, he did a lot of work um, to try to oppose um, mafia, Cypriot mafia, believe it or not. It's pretty horrible, The th- some of the things that they did. It, that his father-in-law told me about. And uh, there was a, and he got rid of a lot of really evil people, but uh, there was a price put on his head and the family had to leave uh, to basically to save my father-in-law's life. So there were four children in the family. Originally one, uh, there were two boys and two girls. One uh, little girl died of thalassemia when she was seven. His uh, father was his young, uh, one of his sisters and the family immigrated to Toronto, Canada, when father was still in high school. He was 17 at the time. So that was a big, that was a big um, adjustment for the family. And, um, uh, but uh, he went, he finished high school there in Toronto, Canada. Afterwards, he uh, had a full scholarship to study classics at the University of Toronto, which is an excellent institution, but he chose to go to Hellenic College because he wanted to be a priest. And then after Hellenic, he went to Greece, to Thessalonica, for his theological education. So um, eventually, um, he got a PhD. That He sort of put, he met me in the meantime. He wasn't going to get married. That's the, that's the story that he tells me. He never wanted to be married we ended up getting, we, we ended up meeting and we got married in 1979. So we've been married 43 years now. And he, um, uh, in the, during, after I married, after we got married, he kind of regretted that he, ne- when I met him, he was already pre- studying for and preparing for his PhD. He had done everything but finish his 
thesis and he didn't want to finish it. He just was very tired by that point. He was almost 30 years old. So he said, I just want to be a simple parish priest. I want to be ordained. I want to get on with my life. But eventually he regretted that. So he went back and he got his PhD and now he's Dr. Father Costa Constantino. And he received his PhD on the subject of Theodore of Mopsuestia and his, the Christology of Theodore of Mopsuestia. So he was, uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia was believed to be the forefather of the Nestorian heresy. But he was also a friend of St. John Chrysostom. So we like to say, even though he ended up sort of being the person behind this thing that eventually became a heresy, we think that maybe he must have had something going for him if he was a friend of Chrysostom. At any rate, so Father Costa, so we want to talk a little bit about your life and your relationship to the scriptures because we have, we've, of course, we've been, he's been doing Bible studies. Now he's retired, by the way. He's not uh, serving any parish in particular. So, Father, growing up, I know in, my, in our house growing up, we had Bibles, and my mother bought a very expensive set of Bible stories. At the time, they're very expensive. They were very famous. My father wasn't happy about it, but she was quite adamant but they were beautifully colored books. And of course, remember growing up that very few books had color. And so that was right. A really big deal. If you even had a book with pictures in it, let alone color pictures. So these were extremely expensive, but what about you growing up? Was there a Bible in your house? Was Bible reading part of your, uh, being how you were raised? Well, my father <clears throat> bought us a Bible. It was three volumes thick, Wow. big, thick volumes. Um, two for the Old Testament and one for the New, and it was the original uh, or the Septuagint. And like, uh, wow, when it talk about the Old Testament and the translation into modern Greek, and it was the same thing with the um, New Testament, the original Greek, and uh, the translation. It was a beautiful edition. Unfortunately, my father did not <laughs> pay the Bible in full. Uh, the whole thing. <laughs> So when I went back, I went to the uh, the bookstore and I asked to pay the rest of the money. And uh, the original owner was not alive. <laughs> and his son said, well, if, if that book made you a priest, that's enough. <laughs> I'm sure my father's soul will be very happy up there. Anyway, but I, I did read it um, when I was um, about 12 years old. The whole thing from cover, cover so to cover. Was it, it so? It was the actual Bible in the original Greek, not not just like Bible stories, like what we had. No, oh, that was the original yeah, that's Bible. Pretty amazing. And of course, I liked the Old Testament because the stories were more juicy and uh, <laughs> a lot of action and uh, that's true. a lot of sin. That's true. Uh, the New Testament was a little bit more. Uh, you know, uh, refined. Yeah, refined. That's true. Whatever. That's true. So your father had a lot to do with that. Did, do you think that that influenced you in in your um, decision to become a priest? Or absolutely. Or, okay. Absolutely. How how was that? Well, I mean, that was the first reading, but I kept uh, reading the Bible all the time. Yeah. And, um, I liked it when I went to the University of Thessaloniki. It was uh, sort of an open university. You could go to as many classes and whatever you wanted once you were. Um, you didn't even have to be a student. So I attended all the New Testament classes, and we were something like uh, five professors, PhDs. Yeah, just teaching New Testament. New Testament. This, this is the history of the New Testament. Uh, this so you used to it, sit in on a lot of classes. Hebrew. I mean, yeah. a, a lot of things were taught. Uh, and each um, wow. department had their own library wow. so i mean i don't know where where else you can find this um in any other german or american wow. university or whatever so i did attend those plus we had the uh, what do you call the uh omades groups groups do you mean like a seminar small like discussion groups they were sort of sunday school but they were beyond sunday school Mm -hmm. They were more active. They were deeper in thinking and discussing things and what have you. We would reenact some of the Bible stories. Of course, the radio at the time was the big thing. Uh, TV came later on. But we could do little skits, little stories. Um, 
for the students of Sunday school. So and you, I we, was one of the major uh, actors yeah. <laughs> because had I not become a priest, I would have become an actor. Okay. I had a very loud voice, uh, very exp expressive in many, yes, many ways. Yes. So I, I did a lot of these uh, like things. Like little with, skits, little yeah. skits. So this now, was in, in, Greece, in the 1970s. In Cyprus, we had what we call the lay theologians. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, the priests actually were not that much educated. Some of them were, but most of them were not. We had the lay theologians who were teaching in high schools. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, they were. They had to be a university graduate in theology and yes. what have you. So they were very well versed in, in the Bible and, and orthodoxy. And I, I was uh, very So that was blessed. in Cyprus you're talking about, where yes. you, the, the lay theologians were the ones who were instructing you in school when you yeah. were growing up. Your religion classes were part of your education as you were growing up in yeah, Cyprus. Also, these groups that I'm telling you that they were, I mean, it started with Zoe, mm -hmm. Life, uh, Sotir, Sevier, then Ap Apolitrosis. Uh, I mean, they were really Redemption. very, very active. Uh, active in many ways. And this Not was... just teaching, but going out to people, talking to them, uh, visiting people, giving alms and uh, having all These kinds are Greek of Orthodox spiritual groups. This was yeah. in Cyprus that you're talking about. Cyprus and Greece, afterwards, later in, in Greece, when you were a student in Greece, so after you came to Canada, you finished high school, you went to Hellenic College. When you went back to Greece, you were part of these groups and you were part of the, you, you were teaching Sunday school too as part of this <laughs> and having these little skits for kids and talking about the Bible and things like that. Did you have, do you have any particular Bible stories that are your favorites? A lot of stories from the from Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, we reenacted quite a few things and what have you. And um, uh, yes. Saint Joseph, the uh, the comely, the, the Joseph, yeah. And, and, and this Genesis. is exactly what I I, I read uh, yesterday when I was reading about the saint of the day. By the way, it was a shock to me, Saint um, Ephrosini. Yes, I mean. It, it makes the tragedies and the comedies of ancient Greek yeah. uh, um, theater very theater and um, like very like very nothing. impoverished. Yeah, nothing I mean, compared especially to the, the, the real lives of the saints. The relationship yeah. between a, a a daughter and a father. Oh mm. my God! Yeah. So uh, so you you liked you thought that they, these things you, you were always very interested in plays and the theater and things like this. So you used to do these reenactments. And this is the one, one of the ways that, that maybe Sunday schools or you know, vacation Bible schools or things like that can make the Bible more uh, memorable, and... alive for, for, for kids. Yes. It's funny because when I was young and I was like, I don't know, you know, maybe fourth or fifth grade, our mother used to take advantage of, there was a Lutheran church in the area and they would have a vacation Bible school for a week and in the summertime, and my mother would always enroll us. So I remember some of the songs I learned when I was a kid about the Bible and even some of the skits that we did. Uh, we did the unforgiving debtor, and I was the person who was the unforgiving debtor in the skit. And I remember that and how important, how impactful that is for kids. So we really need to, this is one way to make the Bible come alive. Yeah, that was I your scored experience. very highly. I got more points, I guess, when I, um, I was the uh, when we did the uh, the parable of the uh, of the prodigal son. Oh, I you, was the perfect prodigal son. You were the son. prodigal son. Oh, you acted out as the <laughs> <laughs> prodigal son. Yeah, there you go. I brought life to that story. I'll, I'll bet me. you did. I'll bet you did. Yeah. So this is why you like to tell me to be very dramatic and very expressive and to shout Absolutely. a lot. Of, so we can't do that all the time, otherwise. People don't want to listen to too much of that, Father. So but, tell but me. this is now the uh, society, That's the true. media and what have you. They want You need something to express it very, very vividly. Yeah. So people would understand. Yes. Yeah. So so tell us about um, what was who or what was the biggest influence on you a, as a young person? It was a lay theologian called uh, Mikhail Mikhailidis Michael. 
And was that was that in, in Cyprus? In Cyprus, we yeah. have usually the same names: Costas, Costandino, mm -hmm. Mikhail, Mikhailidis, Andreas, Andreu. Uh, yeah. So, um, because I didn't. And yeah, tell us, tell tell us about about what was this? So this is somebody from when you were growing up that he had yes. an influence. Was he a teacher of yours? Yes. One of the lay theologians. Very interesting. And he was a lot and so, of things. How I did he influence him you? Four times a week. You met him four times a week. Yes. Your class met yeah, four I times a week. I even went to his home and babysat his children. Wow! But so, uh, was this part of? Did he teach the class for the students four times a week, or yeah. you just would go? Well, it, 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 it wasn't more? the same thing. Uh, the um, I mean, high school we had him twice. Uh, yes. A week, but the other things were weekly. You know the uh, religious the, education, Sunday the groups, school, yeah. education, the groups. So you were, what was it that, about him that influenced you? Well, he was a prisoner at, at, before my years. He was uh, one of the freedom fighters in Cyprus. He was fighting uh, against the British for yes. independence. Yeah, I mean, you hear about the Queen and all these great things, <laughs> and what have you. And the English people were, I mean, masters in this. How to be nice. And, and polite, you know, but and behind the scenes, there was yeah, a lot of... Kill you. Yeah, there was a lot of... In a sweet way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kill I, you I sweetly. lost one of my um, second cousins, Andreas Dimitriou. Mm -hmm. And he had the stump, the signature of the queen. They say, well, maybe she was away at well, the time. Well, I don't understand. But you cannot hang anybody. Because, oh, he was hung because... Yes. But he had... The, what does it mean that he had the signature of the queen? To do what? She had to approve it. Oh, she had to approve. So she he, was he a was murderer actually... in many ways, but <laughs> nobody talks about it. I don't think well, the Cypriots I... really liked her in that much. Words... And, you know, what she did to China and to other other people. I mean, nobody talks about these things because the, yeah. the English are so nice. And, <laughs> so nice. You know, it so was polite. a very, very impressive uh, funeral. Princess and yes, princesses. But, yes, but there oh, was... Shame on but them. But in order to have a... In order to have an empire, there had to be a, a certain amount of brutality to oppress or to suppress all of these people. Think about all the people in India. So in Cyprus was just a little Are you colony. excusing murderers? No, of course not. Of course not. So you're saying that, so when your, your cousin was right. killed by the British, he was executed by the British, you're saying that the, the queen personally approved it? She had to personally approve every yes. execution? Yeah, that is kind of hard to imagine. Maybe that someone she else accused. signed for her, but yeah. the thing is, she was the yeah, one who's the, running it. Because she's the po she was the head, because it was still Jesus an empire. Jesus told us how yes. difficult it is for rich people to go to heaven. Yeah. How many palaces did she have? Yeah, how many millions true. of that's, dollars? That's true. Come on. Yeah, no, that's nobody true. thinks about it. I mean, yeah, that's you give true. a diamond here and there. So tell so, Poor Megan, when is she going to get what, a diamond? What was it about this? <laughs> you're all for late. We're not feeling sorry for Megan, so don't make jokes. <laughs> What was it? Let's get back to this fellow who was a big influence on you. What was it about the classes? He wrote and the many books. Oh, he, really? I mean, very workaholic, well uh, very real in his faith, and I think she passed that to me. Yes, his the, his passion for the faith. Yeah. That's very interesting. In the end, she was going all over the Greece uh, he teaching. Was going, about he was He went Jesus. to Greece and was also teaching yeah. a lot. Well, he was uh, thrown out of Cyprus because at the time Macarius. The archbishop became the the president. He had a problem with that, and mm -hmm. so did I. Okay. I don't think religious leaders All should right. be president. So what Father Costa is talking about here is that... Um, Can we get to the... Yes, uh, yeah, but well, once you you keep opening up new things, like about the queen and uh, Macarius now. So the um, Macarius was the archbishop of Cyprus, and uh, he, um, after the revolution, after the Cypriots won their independence from the British, he also became the first president of the island of Cyprus. So he became a political leader too, and that's against the canons of the church. So because of that, you, the person who was your mentor left and went to Greece. Okay, so I got it. But that so, happened after I left Cyprus. So we um, left at sixty-five. He was uh, he went to Greece, I think, in the seventy-five, seventy-four, seventy-five. Okay. Okay. The I Turks see. came in. The Turks came in. Yeah. And then there was the invasion. So, um, so you you have to, uh, you've you know you had a, a very um, interesting 
background with with this fellow who was a very good big influence for you for his the piety and his enthusiasm for the faith and but also these are the lay theologians yes and i know we don't have them here in, as, as uh, much yeah we do in the orthodox I am one. faith yeah yeah but we should give more power to the women lay, to become another lay theologians, lay theologians. like last week yeah. we met uh, for the first time a uh, sister or mother yeah mother or, uh Nectaria McLeese, Mac- yeah. You should have interviewed her, not yes, me. Who am know, I? Was, uh, well, she, she was a little bit shy. She, a lot of times the nuns don't want to be interviewed. But, uh, yeah, that's that's true. So um, you mentioned when you went to Thessaloniki, you had some. You would attend as many classes on the Bible as you possibly could, and there were four New Testament professors, just in New Testament. That means there was a wow. lot of work, a lot of work being done there. The, it's called the Aristotelian University. In, in Thessalonica. I mean, manuscripts, the history of the Bible. Very the, detailed, the, very the scholarly. Testament. Yes, yeah. not is this is not superficial. So for those of you who think, well, we just read the fathers and that's it, that there's no real serious be, work being done in biblical and studies, that's absolutely not true. Thessaloniki was very patristic. Maybe yes. it was the yes. closeness Money to Blato, the, the Blato. Holy Mountain. Yes, yes, that's It true. was extremely uh, patristic. Whereas the University of Athens was... A little bit more German, influenced French, a little bit yeah. British, but what have you. But the the influences were different. So yeah. speaking of the fact that you were so close to the Holy Mountain, was a, what a couple of hours drive to the port where you would get the boat to go to the Holy Mountain. Mm. So, um, so you visited there. That was an opera. a lot of the students would go and they would visit yeah. the Mount Athos. So um, that that you had the feeling that there was a bit more, perhaps more of a spiritual emphasis there in um, absolutely. The it was uh, the first of one of the years. I forgot which one, but it was the first year that uh, the monastic communities <laughs> increased by one. Until that time, they were down wow. down the drain. Wow! But then they started. And now you have these beautiful monasteries on the holy mountain and elsewhere in Greece, and also convents. So yeah. mo- monasticism was sort of shrinking yes. until when, like the 1970s, and it began to increase. Yeah. So why had it been shrinking, do you think, in in Greece? I think it was uh, because of um, ignorance, because mm-hmm. these groups that I told you, Life Zoe, they yes. started in the 40s, 70s, they renewed. Oh, the uh, faith. Yeah, and they brought a lot oh, of young this... people in, okay. the same thing oh, with Sotir. So it was stricter, and then Apolytris is even stricter. Okay. Than that, more. Uh, this is these things formed after the after the after World War One, after Greece was so, liberated from the Turks, and then after, of course, after that you had the Depression, and then you had uh, World War Two, and after that. Greece, it was after the second even World after War. the Second World War. Second. But the point is, you had after to have the, the first one, or yeah. even before that. Yeah. When the Turks left in 1821 and what have you, the Germans came in. Yes. Uh, Othon, the okay. king. Uh, yeah. uh, there was more influence from the Protestants and the Catholics uh, at that time than any other time. That's why yes. some of the Greeks say it was better to be under the Turks than to uh, be okay. under these people I see. who oh, okay. try to change our faith. And So what happened, dear people who are listening, Greece, the date that Greeks, the Greeks celebrate their independence is 1821. So last year, Greece had the 200th anniversary of its independence, but only a small portion of Greece was actually liberated at that time. The rest of it was still under the Ottoman Turkish Empire. That didn't end until um, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. So that's when most of Greece was liberated, but still there were some islands in the Aegean Sea that remained under Italian control until World War II. So Greece as a modern nation really is not that old in the way the way you think of it, even though it goes back to antiquity as a modern nation is not that old, but it wasn't. So there was German influences. There were Catholic influences. So there's a lot of Western influence in Greece because of all these different occupiers, not to mention Islamic um, sort of uh, suppression of the faith that had a big impact. And so when people criticize us because we don't know the faith or we don't know the Bible, this is one of the reasons that our people weren't able to learn about well, we're these not things. We're allowed to have Greek schools. 
during 400 years with the Ottoman rule. To learn the Greek language yes. so that they could sort of learn about their faith. You had the yeah. secret school where yes. the priests would uh, teach some of the Psalms. That was it. Yeah, there wasn't much that they could to, could learn. So they were, were very far behind the curve. But then after Greece was liberated and after all of the na- islands, they threw off even the Italian control of some islands, then you have the rise of these religious movements. And I really think that we're seeing today in America even the flowering of orthodoxy with our iconography, with the return to traditional chanting, things that traditional Byzantine um, uh, style the of churches, the convents. the convents, everything. This is a very recent development here in America, too, that we're seeing that. And I was amazed when we went to Greece at how many brand new churches, even though Greece has been, um, you know, has suffered a lot financially in Greece and in Cyprus. There are a lot of new churches, et, et cetera. So um, tell me about the fact that you seem to have a specific, you told us about appreciation for the Old Testament and um, whenever we would, uh, when you always had Bible study in your parish, um, whenever we, whenever we would go to a parish, we always had a parish Bible study. And Father Costa thought that that was very important, um, that he have a parish Bible study. And usually Father Costa would handle the classes, they were usually in the weeknights, in the evening, and then I would take it um, in the spring, in the evening, and in the fall. It was Father Costa, and it was always a book of the Old Testament. And then in the spring, I would take over the evening Bible study, and we would study the New Testament. Um, so you you always had parish Bible study as a priority in the parish. I want to see yeah, where we are in, in terms of our time. So we had five Bible classes. There were a I lot. was the assistant there, but we had continuous Bible classes in homes, yes, everywhere. And I, you had the church, and you had the dance groups with yeah. the young people, but you would stop the dance group, the dancing mm-hmm. at a certain point, and, and give them yeah, more a Bible classes. A little bit of a lesson, a little bit of a lesson. So definitely in, in all the parishes, and remember we used to have what we call a year of same. Yes, yeah, so I want to talk about that, but it's, it's time for a break. So when we come back, we're going to talk about how you incorporated study of the Bible and just uh, learning more about the Bible in, into the parish life. And I think this might be something interesting to people as an alternative to what we ordinarily think of. So join us after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Hey there, Ancient Faith Radio listeners. I'm Bobby Maddox, station manager of AFR. And as you might be aware, the very popular Ancient Faith Radio app was canceled unexpectedly by the company that built and supports it. We apologize for any inconvenience that this may have caused. The good news is that we have created a brand new app that will launch this coming September. And boy, will you be pleased with the change. Not only is the interface more intuitive and easy to use, but the new app will totally revolutionize the way that you listen to Ancient Faith Radio. Among other features, it will include the ability to create playlists and share them, and a subscription option that will keep you up to date on new episodes of your favorite podcasts. And speaking of favorites, the app will likewise allow you to mark your preferred podcast as such and store them in a convenient, accessible location. We are thrilled with how the new app is turning out and can't wait to offer it to you. So fear not, AFR listeners, and thanks for your patience. The new, incredibly robust Ancient Faith Radio app is on its way this coming September. Look for it soon in your preferred application store. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Yes, I'm back with my special guest tonight, Father Costa Costandino, my husband of 43 years, who's been a parish priest in the Greek Orthodox Church here in America for many years. And uh, um, the tour, after, toward the very end of his, first you had, he, we've had some large parishes, we've had a lot of mission parishes in the past um I think 20, 25 years, mostly he was serving mission parishes. 
He's very, very good at helping small parishes grow. It's just a lot of work. And one of the last things he did, which he mentioned early on in this little podcast, was that he returned to Cyprus and was serving at a parish in the region where he was from as a boy and got a chance to go back there and serve in the Church of Cyprus for several months. So that um, that was something that he also wanted to have Bible study there. But it was always a very big part of his ministry that he would always have a parish Bible study and made that a priority. And when uh, we had one particular parish where we really couldn't get anybody to come to Bible study. I remember that we, we were, I mean, it was, I see, I think the reaction in the various parishes would depend in, in one parish we had a, you had a really good response, especially considering the size of the parish. And in that parish, even the parish council members were coming and the parish council members, they were very, very involved. And that was at, you know, at St. Andrews and San, San Luis Obispo. But other times we had, you know, 25 or 30 people coming and sometimes rather large parishes. It was hard to attract more people than that. And then uh, one parish, I think we'll, we'll keep it nameless, we couldn't get anybody to come. And after having a uh, Bible study for like, uh, two, the, sometimes there would be two people, maybe there would be three people, and we tried and tried and nobody would come. So then Father Costa said, we're going to do something different. So what did you decide to do? Well, we decided to have a year of St. Paul, a year of St. John the Beloved, I mean, uh, a year of the Apocalypse. And um, this way we got more uh, interest and attention, and I would go to the various groups. Yeah. When we would have the Philopter, who was the Society of the Poor, and we had a meeting. They were getting a Bible class whether they liked it or not. The same thing with uh. the youth, the, the young adults. Um, Greek school. Uh, a lot of things were happening, and w- with this, uh, with the year, for instance, of St. Paul, yeah. for the little kids of Sunday school to answer 300 questions about St. Paul, about the letters, to yeah. know what the theme was, and what have you. And at one time, we had a, a test, and seven of them, of the whole Sunday school, yes, of course, they got a perfect, perfect score. Yeah. score. Yeah. They, they were in so, a paper. I mean, let me explain to somebody, to everybody, what, what he meant here. What happened was we could not get people to come to Bible study. So Father Costa said, well, I'm going to take it to them. So he began to sort of organize everything and according to themes, and it was according to the year. It was basically the, the ecclesiastical year from September through August. And it, the first one he did was the year of St. Paul. And everything, he tried to coordinate this with the Sunday school so that they incorporated something about St. Paul with all the different grades. And then Father Costa gave all of his sermons had to do with the different, the life of Paul, the epistles of Paul. And he would always give two sermons. There was one in Greek and one in English. And they, um, then he would talk about St. Paul. Then whenever there was a meeting that he would attend, like for Goya, which is the youth, teenage youth group, or for the Philoptikos, which is a women's group, he would always spend about 15 minutes talking about that subject, which that year it was St. Paul. So in other words, it was, he took the Bible study to them. So he says, well, they're not going to come to me, but I'm going to take the Bible to them. And it was actually very effective. So at the end of the year, he created this little booklet called The Year of St. Paul with questions and answers about St. Paul's life and about all of the epistles of Paul. And then he decided to have uh, like a little test for all the Sunday school and seven of the, the kids got a, a perfect score. And we, there was one, only one prize, unfortunately. <laughs> so they gave it to the youngest child who got the perfect score. I think she was in second grade or something like this. And the, I think it was to, to go away to camp. It was one of the, it was the New England camp in New England. Oh my God, where we gave away where, what this was. I was going to say where the camp was, but it was an Orthodox camp. It was our diocese camp. So at any rate, that was one. That was the first thing that you tried. That was the only place we really had to do that, but it was very effective, I think. So um, after that, we did the year of St. Luke, where you did Luke Acts. We did the year of John, where you did all of the sermons, the Bible, well, the talks that you gave at the various to the various groups, 
some of them complained. I think they didn't want you to talk about Jesus or the Bible when you went to the meetings for 15 minutes. He says, I'm going to talk about it for 15 minutes. So um, we did the year of John. Uh, and then one year he said, this is going to be the year of the Psalms. And Father Costa being an Old Testament, uh, somebody who really has an appreciation for the Old Testament, I thought, oh, this is not going to be very interesting. But, you know, and he would have everybody open up their Bibles. We had pew Bibles. And whenever we were talking about a, a book of the Bible, whatever his sermon was, he would have them open it up and look at it. And he went through all of the Psalms and gave a sermon on every single Psalm. And it was actually so interesting. And um, I just think it was phenomenal. And he gave, uh, you know, um, I think it, and then I think for that one, for the year of the Psalms, you had, you asked the Sunday school to have the children memorize Psalms. And that was really good. And then at the end of the year, they stood up there in, in the Salea and they recited their Psalms, each of them. So that was really wonderful. One, so, one thing that I want you to realize, and I'm sure that most of you have realized already, our Bible classes are a little bit different than the usual Bible classes. When I mean, you can hear on the internet, YouTube, whatever, all kinds of Bible classes. Our Bible classes from day one, they contain the fathers of the church. Mm -hmm. There is a big difference. To be orthodox, you have to use tradition. If it's just, I mean, you okay. definitely you need the science and what have you to talk about the New Testament, the Old Testament, and this and that. But also to put the wisdom of the fathers. Otherwise, what are we doing? Yeah, so, you know, we, so we have to, to interpret the Bible according to tradition. Now, we're, we're down to our last 20 minutes, Father Costa, and yeah. there were people who, you, I guess you refa you're famous for loving Christmas, and all this love Christmas, but they're um, almost all, not all. Somebody actually wrote to me recently and said, would you please ask Father Costa why, I why he loves Christmas? Because he personally finds Christmas kind of depressing. And I think that there are some people who find it or get depressed at Christmas. Maybe they're lonely. I'm not sure what their situation is. But will you tell us why you like Christmas so much? Well, first of all, I like it so much that I extend it. It's not just uh, November and December. It starts September. He's already listening. He's listening to Christmas carols in his car when he drives. Everywhere it's at too night, early for I me. sleep. I wake yes, up so with the, uh, Christmas carols, Christmas songs, yes. all kinds of traditions. I think we should be respectful to all traditions and listen to even... Okay. You know, Christmas so, carols in other languages and what have that's you. That's fine. But... And examine them a little bit. Now, first of all, I wanted to make uh, to make you understand that uh, Christmas was not the original day of uh, birth of Christ, okay? Okay. You know that in Orthodox, even to this day, um, some of the Serbs and the Russians yes. and what have you, it's uh, uh, January 6th, um, the day of Epiphany or Theophany. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we now we have this fast of 40 days, and some people are trying to make it like, you know, great the Lent. great Lent. Yeah. And it's not the same thing. It's not the same theme. And I, you know, sometimes it gets to me, you know, come on, we cannot have everything macabre in the Orthodox Church. I mean, <laughs> oh, crying this and uh, apologizing, apologizing, and having remorse about okay. this, remorse about that. And... You know, well, for, for our sins and fine, well, that's okay. That, that's I'm more for against. Great Lent, yeah. But that, that's more uh, for Great how Lent. How can you do it now? There's a, a Lent there. What there is a Lent, there? During yeah. Lent, you cannot have parties. You cannot really rejoice. That's why I'm extending it, starting from <laughs> September. So, uh, this way, we can enjoy Christmas, and I believe joy, joy and is. happiness, uh, two um, sensations. I call them sensations. That's how I feel about the um, uh, the feelings about this this time of the year. So that, that is the anticipation... We can be happier than other times. Okay, so you feel let, let like... Me, let me just say but, a few things about the Lent. Okay, but wait a minute. So you're saying that you love Christmas because it's a time of joy? So what if a person doesn't feel joy at that time? Because you're, you're why are you joyful? Because you're celebrating, you're looking forward to celebrating the incarnation of the Son of God? Is it... The religious thing, the joy that the salvation comes, yeah, has means, come? 
Yes, the coming, coming of Christ. The coming well, of Christ. He comes a little bit earlier. To my okay, for you. <laughs> okay, you're not waiting. You're okay. Uh, go ahead. I have. I'm going to talk about that. How go to ahead. make go other ahead. people happy. All right, but go ahead. Let me talk a little bit about the this fasting period. Forty days. For goodness sakes, in the beginning there was no Christmas. But anyway, we, we accept it. I, I believe that tradition is a living thing, and we have to follow it. It doesn't have to be just the, whatever they were doing in the original church. No. The church has accepted it, and the thing that I like about these 40 days is that there are supposed to be 40 liturgies. So always give your names to the priest. Mm -hmm. And remember these little pieces of paper are very important. It's what the thief said to Jesus on the cross. Remember me in your yeah, kingdom. Yeah. That's why there's little a few pages of paper, whatever, with the names. So in some parishes, very important. In some parishes they, they He have went to paradise because, because of he asked that. Them to remember. So you should be giving names to the priest to commemorate those who have fallen asleep and also the living, and also remember to give something anyway. to the priest when you do that. No. The fasting started, it was... That was later, that they started the Christmas fast. Later on, fourth fast. century. Actually, the fasting was I think it was much later than century. that. Yeah, much, the much later century. than that. The fasting for prior to the Nativity yeah. of Christ was and much later than that. you have to remember that, that it, it was a few days in the beginning, then it became because 40 they days. They made it longer and, and longer. And to this day, some of the Russians, of the Serbs and what have you... Uh, you know, they're not fasting Saturdays and Sundays because they believe and, and correctly that these are resurrection days. You're not supposed to be uh, fasting on these fast, days. Yes. Uh, I remember that one of the monasteries was saying, no, you have to fast on Saturday because you're receiving Holy Communion on Sunday. Absolutely that's, that's not. Against this the is false. Of the church, you have to right? know the history of seeing Fosha's. Who fought this? The Catholics that's were true. saying, that's no, true. you have to fast on Saturdays too, out of respect. And he was saying, but this was not the uh, tradition of the church. Anyway, uh, accept it. Uh, we have it today. And uh, now, definitely, it's not as strict of a fast as it is for uh, Great, Great Lent. Lent. The, we have to Christmas remember that. The there, a big, a big, there is a big difference there. I think we should be a little bit more lenient, especially to young people and what have you. So I said, do the parties before you start the Lent on the 15th of November after, and after, after the 12 days of Christmas, like they used to do it. And a lot of people have forgotten that already. Luckily, the Orthodox, I think, still do that. Or at least we try. It's hard with the rest of the with the rest of the world celebrating before Christmas and nothing after. But we do the opposite. Now, make sure that together with these names that you give, and the, some of the memorial services, mm -hmm. what have you, the visits to the cemeteries, the making goliva, the boiled wheat, and what have you, you have to give alms. That's part okay. of, of mourning. And some people don't realize that. No. How can you make this, this mourning, at, at least for other people, happy and joyous? So you're saying that part of the celebration of the Nativity and, and Lent in general is not simply watching what you eat for the fasting part, but it has to include almsgiving. That's very, very important. I think that's true. And that's something that the fathers used to talk about all the time, that the almsgiving is very important. Now, a lot of people talk about why Christmas. Definitely wasn't why Christmas where it happened. But the thing is, you know, fine. We accept these traditions. They are nice. They're cute. I mean, you like the snow. You like the purity, the cold, maybe during these months. Unless you're in yeah. Australia. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever it is, I mean, enjoy them. You have uh, YouTube now. You got all these media and all that, that make uh, uh, heavens rain and rain and rain and what have you. Remember, it's not the same as the great fast of Pascha. Okay, so you said that. Also, help the missions. It's the best time to do it. I mean, you know, did you hear about Father Themis, Adamo? Uh, for example, in Sierra Leone, yeah. and and so many, uh, there are many others. But, yeah, there are many. But what Father uh, Themis is doing, he got his doctorate, he got I mean, yes. uh, best education, whatever. He's in there doing uh, mission work. A lot of missions everywhere. I remember uh, many times, especially before the pandemic, we would take um, all kinds of toys 
uh, give them to Father Ramon Merlos, one of our priests yeah, in this yeah. area, and take him down to Mexico, Mexico. and make yeah. a, a lot, lot of, of needy, kids happy. There's a lot of needy people, yeah. We have to remember. Visit lonely, poor, and sick people. Old age homes uh, are full of them. The streets are That's full true. of them. Take a blanket uh, and, and give them to a homeless person. And give them a pillow, a nice pillow, you know. Spend a little bit of money give them one of those cute uh, pillows, whatever. Now, write Christmas cards way in advance. And this is good because you're going to receive uh, some answers back. But, you know, write these Christmas cards. Send them everywhere you can to people that hurt you or you hurt, to people that hate you or you hate. Um, shock them. Give them a lot of love and joy and keep most of it for yourself because that's how you get the joy, by giving joy to to other people. So what you're saying that is then in order, if, if somebody isn't, isn't particularly drawn to Christmas or they feel depressed at that time, it's because they're not engaged so much with or thinking about what they can do for others at Christmas time, that's really the problem for them. Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. Yes. See that in the, the book Luke of Acts. Acts. Yes. But the thing is, that's where you get the joy, by making other people happy. Yes. You give them joy to the kids. I mean, sometimes I why I don't like what's happening is become, becoming too commercial to this yeah. and to that. Come on, you uh, cheap people. <laughs> hey, give some gifts to little kids. I, yeah, that's a lot of joy. I remember much, yeah. when we get one single gift, yeah. present, the joy. What's wrong with that? It's Christmas for good. It's giving. Jesus is coming down. Do you I think mean, the animals are rejoicing? Do you think there's too much giving, maybe to kids, like in the family? So of course we want to see our kids happy, and we know that there are things that they want, so we give them presents at Christmas. But what about teaching them? to also be giving at Christmas. What about um, giving less to the children in the family, whether it's our immediate rel or others or other relatives, frankly, um, and instead giving more to the poor? Do you think that's important? Absolutely. Make the kids write two lists. One that goes to Santa Claus, and I'm glad that it's Santa Claus is not, uh, not Jesus. Uh, you know, Ask them, well, let them ask whatever they want. They're not going to get everything, but they're going to get a few things. But make them write a list that is double the size of what they're going to give out what to other gonna... children, what they're going to do for other people. Visit, as I said, some of these lonely people. You know how yes. much they love to see a young person there? Yeah. Come on, take your kids there and to... and talk to them. Let, let them sing. To teach them a yeah, couple. Yeah, that's of... true. We used to do that. I don't know how much that's done anymore. When I was in the youth group at Saint Spirit, and when I was a teenager, every year we would go sing Christmas carols at the convalescent homes of the old people. And I don't know how much. And then in Sacramento, our choir used to do that. Um, I don't know how much that's done anymore. But these things where we try to encourage the youth to do things, especially Christmas time for the needy. There's there's a certain amount of that, but um, the pandemic has done us a lot of harm, and we need to uh, revive ourselves, revive our faith, strengthen it, and bring a lot of joy to other people and to ourselves as well. We are entitled to a little bit of joy. Well, why do we have to be crying all the time and weeping? Sorry. Okay. Okay, uh, so you're saying that there's a bit too much emphasis on repentance. I know we need balance. And of course, at this period of, of, of this church year is a time of anticipation of the coming of Christ, which is not a mournful time. It's a happy time. So even though we have a fast because we need to be prepared spiritually for this event, it's not a time of mourning and repentance the way Great Lent is. And we shouldn't confuse the two of those. Yes. The Christmas Lent. As a Christian, um, uh... As Christians, we have to be able to overturn the tables. Something that is really sad, macabre, on your neighbor. Uh, you know, you get up in the morning and you're so depressed, for goodness sake. We have to treat these as temptations and fight them. Overturn the tables, something that is really bothering us, something that makes us mm. feel 
depressed, lonely, turn not to to give joy to other people. Keep some for ourselves. I joy to other people, the almsgiving. Believe me, I think it does more for you than for others. Mm-hmm. And uh, start writing some envelopes and some checks or some yes. uh, money to give to those who wait at the corner. And just also say, from a Christian, mm-hmm. don't put your name or whatever, but, you know, make them understand that Christians are alive in this world. They're not dead. You know, you just look at them and see, see them uh, driving by and they're smiling and doing absolutely nothing. Envelopes. <laughs> so, so, you know, when I, I spoke about almsgiving, uh, there were pe- a lot of people who would say to me that you, you shouldn't, you, you, the people who are, you know, begging on the street corner, on, they're on the streets. A lot of these people are on drugs or they're alcoholics and you're just enabling them to stay, um, you know, addicted to drugs or something like this. And St. John Chrysostom speaks about this. And he says that that's not your place to judge whether or not you think that person needs it or whether or not they're going to misuse it, that it's our job to give. And even, you know, what St. Paisius talks about that, that there was a, a person who was a drunkard and he and Paisius was helping him. And he said, they said, why did you give money to this man? Because he, he just takes his paycheck and he drinks it. He says, yes, I know. But now, if I give him money, then maybe he won't, he'll use that money to drink and then his paycheck, he'll buy some food for his wife and kids, you know? So we don't really know how that helps, but definitely we're not supposed to be in a position of judging others and saying, well, even the person, Chrysostom says, is even the person who is, is a, you know, on, is a drink, uh, who is drinking and he's uh, poor because of that, this person still has to eat and this person still needs to live. And that's for God to decide, but not for us. So I think it's... And you uh, can write something, as I said earlier. Give some, you know, some words of encouragement. A dollar means something. So when the guy gets $10 from a passerby or whatever, yeah. uh, from a car, just put, say, go to church on Sunday. Yeah. Or, you know, ask, read... Bless them, ask their name. I always ask their name. This book of the Bible. Father, I when I when I give somebody an envelope, I always ask their name. I think that's important because then it's a person. You know, we have to remember that it's you don't a have person. That much of a time. They, you, usually, you don't have a lot of time. Sometimes uh, you don't. Yeah, green. Yeah, but I often yeah. try to do that. Anyhow, God loves a happy, a, a cheerful, cheerful giver. giver. If you're gonna be a judge, and if you're gonna start. Yeah. criticizing this yeah. and that, who doesn't decided, give anything. Who's deciding who's worthy and who's not worthy. Yeah, we can't do that. That's not a good thing. So it's for us to do, to, to give. God bless and, you. I don't want to say Merry Christmas because <laughs> Merry, it's a very bad word. <laughs> it means to take advantage of the uh, license period and do okay, bad things. Well, this say, is... as the English say, <laughs> Blessed Christmas. No, they say Happy Christmas, oh, Father. Happy Christmas. They don't say Christmas. Blessed Christmas. We should say Blessed Christmas. But Father's saying that once once Father Costa heard somebody explain that Mary, they said Mary meant that you were supposed to drink and get drunk. And so that's why in America they say Merry Christmas. In England they say Happy Christmas. But we really should say Blessed Christmas. It's still very early because we're still in September, Father, to be talking about Christmas. But um, at any rate, do you have any final words for our audience? Thanks for spending an hour and a half chatting with us. I think everybody got a little bit more of a sense of your personality. So you believe in balance in all things, which is an orthodox virtue. Everything in moderation. In moderation and balance. The Greek word for moderation, you know what it is? Perfection. Ah, that's very interesting. And Jesus says, be perfect like my father is perfect. So, yes. No, so we're because we be some perfection, kind of a balance, okay? yeah. So not don't, don't not extreme following situations and what have you. And and there, there are people who have spiritual fathers that every little detail of their life has to do with this and that, and he approved it. Come on. So what you're, you're trying a to free say, person, and orthodoxy, orthodoxy really is all about balance, yeah. and this is something that that is part of our Fronima that we have to learn. Because many, and of course the fathers say this, especially St. Gregory the theologian, but many Orthodox people 
sort of get the idea that to be orthodox is to be severe, to be strict, etc. And that is not what orthodoxy is about. This is I'm what you're saying. saying. Not, not to be obedient to your spiritual father, but, you know, not to be, not to be, in moderation. Uh, yeah, not to be overly uh, dependent, not to be overly strict, not to be overly lenient, but to find that balance. So do you have any final words for us, Father, or just a blessing? I want you to be very happy, very joyous, and bring a lot of joy to other people. And um, pray that Jesus comes into your hearts, to all of our hearts, whether we are believers or not believers, to enlighten us, to strengthen us, to empower us, uh, to give us a lot of joy that we have enough to give to others. We should give to others. And that's, but that's how we're going to find joy for ourselves is by the giving to others. Thank you, Father. Rejoice in the Lord. Thank you, Father. Uh, Happy Christmas. <laughs> okay, so blessed Christmas. <laughs> blessed Christmas. It's, even though it's very early. It's still only September, dear people. So just by way of reminder, next week there will not be a live show, but the week after that I will be coming to you live from St. Tikhon's, where I will be interviewing Dr. David Ford. He's done a lot of work on St. John Chrysostom. I think you're going to find the conversation very interesting. But after that, I do promise... We will get started on our study of the Gospel of Matthew. So thank you again, Father Costa, for being my very special guest. You're a special guest in a way that no other special guest is a special guest. Being my husband, thanks for sharing your insights with us. And I hope you'll come back and we can have other conversations about these things because I do believe that people love hearing from you. At any rate, I wish you all well. And uh, here, let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Amen. Amen. Good night.